So if you are here to see D8 lessons learned and how we can make D8-9 better, um, or sorry, D9 better, then you are in the right room. Um, so I'm Shannon Vitesse. Hi. I work for Commerce Guys, and uh, I've been doing project management for a long time. And I've been doing um, some project management on Drupal 8, which is why this all came about, because I was able to get some information um, from the team about how things were moving, and a lot of ideas kind of turned out of that, especially at DrupalCon Munich. Uh, lots of conversations were happening around how could we improve this, what are the problems that we're having. So obviously that was a long time ago, and lots of things are changing and evolving, but I still feel like those core conversations that were happening are still relevant today. So. That's why this happened. Um, so obligatory plug, go to the Commerce Village. It's amazing. It will change your life. Um, so we have all kinds of awesome partners that are there with really amazing commerce services. We're doing a kind of challenge where you have to go around and get something from each partner, and then you can come to our Commerce Guys Saloon, which is tomorrow night, uh, well, tomorrow at 3 o'clock, and have a beer with us. So that's your challenge, and I wanted to point it out to you, so please go do. And then, you know, obviously, what am I doing up here? So I've been project managing, and I feel like I've been being a little bit crappy because I've been working a lot. So if you're interested in working on Drupal 8, please do uh, come and talk to me and give me your card. I'm recruiting actively um, all the time. So we're looking for people to help, and I'm just basically trying to get the word out about things that I think this is easy for me to do. Um, point out trends, point out issues, and that's why we're here to talk. So feel free to join the conversation. It's basically going to be um, like what's going on right now? How are things looking in the in the Drupal initiative like setup, the process that we're using? What is it? Um, how's the organization? What are the teams doing? What if we did something different? And then talking to you about like what is involved in that. So here's what I think we're doing today. We have people at the bottom, and I apologize for the small text. So people at the bottom who I consider abstainers. They use the software, but they're not really involved. They're not actively building things. They're not actively um, building core. They're just kind of there using it. And that's a big group. Then you have your novices, which are people who don't have a ton of experience, but you know they've done some things, and they've got a little bit of experience, and they're able to do limited things, so we can't use them a whole lot. But we have a lot of those people, and we like those people, so keep coming. <laughs> but then we have another level, which I'm calling tier two, which is beginners, and so they have experience and they can do stuff, but they haven't worked on core extensively, and they don't really know about the process, and that's where people like Jess are awesome, because core mentors, and you can go to drupal.org and search core mentors, they will give you all kinds of information there. Beginners are really useful to us because they are people that we can turn into experts, which is the next level. And experts um, and beginners are, are kind of cruelly missing in our triangle as far as I can tell today. And then you have initiative owners, which are kind of these awesome people up front who are doing things. And over here, they're interspersed. So initiative owners are, I think, you know, carrying the torch for what they want to do and trying hard and they're getting totally run over by all the work that needs to get done and burned out. Um, so our current organization right now is pretty much an initiative owner with some help, and I think that there are a few um, problems that are involved in this. So this is the current organization right now. So you've got initiative owners at the top. They've got a couple of experts working with them, usually. Maybe a few more than just two, but not, not usually like five or six or ten experts that are working with them. Usually it's just a couple of people that are just really awesome, really dedicated. So they're, they're bearing the brunt of all the work. And these people are, are you know, also helped out by some reviewers, which are all the little diamonds underneath. And those people are awesome, too. They help them get things done. But it's not like there's a million of those people. It's limited in the initiatives. And so this is a problem for us because we're missing those, those two key groups. And these are people that we can kind of level up and teach and, and bring on board. So the current organization also has a couple of other parts, which are obviously like people like me who try to do project management, which is right now very limited. So it's basically down to communication. And then people who do committing, and finally people who do front end things. So that's the second group. And finally you have a third group, which is just other community people. So people who do ladders, um, teachings, you know, how to get involved with core, people who work on funding, and people who do all kinds of awesome design stuff. And then all the other community members, just a random person who comes in and reviews one thing and then leaves and just like, this is too hard, I can't do it, or whatever. I'm lumping them into that 
kind of other community people. So this is how we're working today. And it's a little bit hard because obviously the people in that top level are really doing all the main hard stuff all the time. So they're the most prone to all these different problems. So burnout and well poisoning. We're picking the same people to do the same things because they've got core management knowledge and they've got all this background info and they know how this works because they had to work on that. So they keep on having to you know, pick the same people to do the same things and they're getting really, really burned out. And then they also have lack of information for the public. Because these people are so knowledgeable, they can't always take the time because they're really overburdened to do all this stuff to like give a weekly update of what's going on in the initiative. So everyone else is like, when are we getting Drupal 8? They don't know anything about what's happening or maybe they get some information but it's you know, maybe not in the digestible format that they need. So I mean, PMs could really help with that but they're hard to come by and we're all really busy and blah, blah, blah. So that problem exists. And then we have some poor like interaction and dependency issues because again, the same people are, are really burdened with all the same work. It's hard for us to take the time to sit down for two hours and say, okay, in the next month, where are the dependencies that are gonna affect us? What is the biggest risk right now? And we're doing some of that, but not enough in terms of being able to like, plan for them. It's more just reaction, like, where, okay, we're on fire here. What do we do about that um, type of stuff? And then that also leads to really hard to plan schedules issues. So it's, it's almost impossible right now in the current setup to actually plan anything because people are not reliable, myself included, hey, um, to do stuff because we're all volunteers. So planning a volunteer project is really tough because we don't have any funding, we can't organize correctly. And also it's just really hard to onboard newbies because we've got those two levels that we're missing but we don't necessarily have the infrastructure to teach them how to do stuff. So I wanted to talk to you about an idea that came out of Munich, which was, you know, how could we organize teams for the next round of Drupal development? And maybe even something that we can use during the last legs of Drupal 8. That would be awesome if people would kind of rise up and get this done, but I'm not gonna hold my breath. I'm just thinking more D9, this would be cool. So I think that it would be really cool if we could have three groups, helpers, builders, and organizers, or sorry, designers. So the helpers are people who are gonna help um, organize things and communicate and fund. So these are all the support mechanisms and people like initiative owners, I don't think want the burden of that on top of having to do all the architecture and all the big heavy lifting and all of the like onboarding and teaching and documenting and upgrade path building and all of that. I think if we could have a group of helpers, that would be really cool. Um, builders would be people who obviously are doing all the building and testing and um, documenting and reviewing. And designers are people, in my mind, who would be doing UX, UI, um, reviews, usability, all kinds of really awesome things that are not incorporated enough into the initiatives right now. But also very, very important. So let me tell you a little bit more about this vision and then we can have a conversation. So the first group helpers, um, I see it as project managers, so coordinate, document milestones, um, then there's people who teach, so they would find the education gaps, like where do people get stuck? Where do they not know how to learn how to do something? Um, help build ladders so that they can learn those things and then find new mentors and track those KPIs. And finally, communicators, people who will meet with groups, um, communicate about their progress, and basically keep all the rest of us who are not in the issue queues every single day, like watching what's happening, kind of up to speed on how things are going. Like, well, we're getting close to the end, or you know, we're really far away. That type of high level thinking is not easy to communicate unless you're in regular contact. We need more of those people. So that's what um, communicators are to me. And then finally, funders. I think it's really important to have funding in order for this method to be sustainable. Because it's so hard to plan a volunteer team, you don't know where they are, you don't know when they're gonna be available. Something personal, something professional might come up and trump whatever they're doing volunteer at any given moment. So it's just impossible to plan for without funding. But if we could fund people, and we have been funding people, especially Greg, it just makes it easier. So I think that that's a really important part. And then you'd have tier one and tier two. So this is basically people who are interested, but don't know what to do, and then um, tier two would be people who have been doing a little bit of it and who can help the tier one people kind of learn more. So that's what I see as helpers. And then you have builders, which I really think is the key to this. Having multiple levels of builders is where we're gonna see the most success. And you'll have initiative owners who are there to do architecture, 
um, monitor progress, unblock issues, help find teachers and funders and, and help with uh, coordinate with communicators and project managers on, on what needs to actually happen in the initiative. I see these people as the leaders. They're there to set the strategy and they're there to communicate about the strategy and the progress of, the, of that vision. And then the experts I see as people who are there to do the awesome stuff. Um, so this is a bit of a switcheroo from what we're doing right now, because right now it's like the initiative owner is the expert. And I think we need to have them be in a different level than the experts. Experts are people who can do stuff, and this is where we're cruelly lacking people right now. Funding might help with that. Um, so these people code stuff, they maintain things, they do summaries, they do um, trainings, they find people, they, do, they can do all kinds of things. Uh, tier two would be a certain level of beginner, uh, who have some limitations, they're not yet experts, but they're pretty well up there. Maybe they can train tier one, or maybe they can even train novices. Um, and then you obviously have people who are just getting started who need some documentation. So that's how I see the builders uh, group. These are people who are actually doing things in terms of you know code. And then finally, designers, who I'm, I'm sorry I'm lumping it into this category, if that makes any of you mad, but it was the best category that I could come up with. Um, I see this as people who really care about how things work for the user and who care a lot about usability and user experience. So um, I see that it's a little bit tough for me to, to really define what that should look like, but I'm thinking like themers, designers, UXers unite um, to find ways to review the work that's coming out of the code so they'd have to work closely with the project manager and with an initiative owner on the progress of when is the right moment to step in, when is the right time to really start talking about UI. I know it's a challenge we face right now in D8. It's not super clear. And I think that having some more structure around this would be great. So if anyone in here is working on that type of content, I'd love to talk to you afterwards and just get your, your feedback, or maybe even during the session, <laughs> um, since it is a conversation. So um, basically, the big difference between what we're doing now and what, we, what I want to do is that right now, we don't have a clear plan, and we're just kind of like, going about as best we can. So we plan a little bit. We don't really know how to train anybody to get started. It's, it's more like, core mentors, please come save us. Teach people how to get started. And I think you know, in an initial, initiative level, it would be great for them to, to have each their own core mentor, an onboarder, uh, a person to help for the people interested in what they're doing instead of you know, just one group that has to kind of cover all areas and you're all over the place in triage. So um, I think that's where, where we are right now, and it's really hard to train because we're all too busy doing, doing things. Um, D9, I think it would be great if we could actually plan ahead, like know more about what the goals and milestones are um, based on what didn't get into D8, for example, and then decide um, if we like it, the initiatives and how that's going. Maybe we can do another round of funding and try and get a set group of teams. I think at least the initiative owners and at least three experts should be funded for every single initiative. I think if we can't do that, <laughs> yay! Um, if we can't do that, then I think that we're just relegating ourselves to the same fate that we've already had, which is try your very best, but you know, no guarantees. Hmm. <laughs> I don't think that's what anyone wants. Um, so I think that that's going to help us, and I really think education is key to this um, methodology working. Having a way to Bring people into the fold is important, especially with each release, how much more complicated and how much more um, you know, interesting and awesome it's getting. It's also getting much harder to teach people. So we need those steps. So there are a few dependencies and questions that I'm gonna put out there for us to discuss and then I'm gonna shut up. Um, so basically, like initiatives uh, need these trends, so what if, what if you disagree with initiatives? Not everyone likes this idea. So right now, if you're not familiar with it, initiatives are basically different um, groups of goals for features, like whiskey and views and all this stuff. So not everyone agrees with initiatives. If you disagree, I want to hear from you to know like why you wouldn't want to keep doing that. Um, ladders is another one. So ladders is an initiative. I think it's not got its legs yet, its sea legs. It's still trying to, to find people to stay involved. I was involved briefly, but got pulled away on a bunch of stuff, so maybe that's happening to everybody. So basically, Ladders is a teaching initiative that says, I'm gonna learn how to do something, I'm gonna document it, and then I'm gonna share it, and then I'm gonna teach someone else how to do it, and then they become a mentor to someone else, and they tell two friends, and they tell two friends, type of thing. It's a great concept, and I think that it would be really cool if we could do this, but I think there's also a dependency, like, 
we need to do this now if we're going to be able to use it in the next round. So we'd need a massive following to get on board, and that sounds kind of tough to do. And then finally, the big ugly question of funding. Like, who do we ask? Who gets what? How much? Um, how much do we need? Ugh, it's just all very hairy. Who manages the money? It's a big problem in, in this environment, especially because we're open source and we're nonprofit. So we can't just say, oh, just write me a check. I'll, I'll deal with it. No, it's like really a tough issue to solve. Um, so that's a, a whole other question. Um, and I'm interested in, in whatever ideas you have, and these are some alternatives, because what I just said is super ambitious. <laughs> um, so maybe we could try like funding one initiative or like one resource in each initiative instead of all four. That might be a little bit more realistic. Um, trying to leverage several parts of visibility um, to get interest, so really a lot more communication about what we're trying to do to help people who are you know, busting their bums almost said the A word, um, <laughs> trying to get funding and help them get that really good reasoning of why this is going to make a huge difference. Um, maybe we could focus on ladders. That's another way. Instead of you know trying to get the money, we could try to get the people. And then finally, um, just combining roles. So this is kind of the route where we're at right now. It's like PM slash communicator slash coordinator slash whatever. Um, and that's a way that we can have fewer people involved to do these things. But I think these things still need to happen um, individually. So like you should have someone to communicate, but you should also have someone to organize. And if, you, if there can be two people, that's better. But um, worst case scenario, it'll keep being one person. Um, so then finally, trampoline off ladders and ladderies um, to get special educational perks. Basically, um, have their employer sponsor what they're doing, which is what Commerce Guys does a lot. Um, so we've got several employees who do a lot of you know, core work, and it's a great way to try and get the help. So those are some ideas that are a little bit less um, ambitious, and that's everything that I had for today. So now we can talk about stuff. So things to kick us off that conversation. I'm really curious to know, uh, first of all, do you have any questions about the D8 organization right now and these ideas on D9? And then second, I'm really interested in having a conversation about what do you think about the feasibility of these teams and these roles? Does this like even make sense to you or does this sound weird? Someone answer. <laughs> you. Yeah, Mike. Who do you see as organizing all of these things? Is that a role for the DA, or is that a role for the community in self-organizing teams, or for a company to, to organize? Oh, you mean like who becomes the initiative owner, and who becomes the project management lead, and who becomes whatever? Exactly. Um, OK, that's a good question. So I think right now we're, we're doing it in a kind of self-organizing way, and it's very organic. I think that's the best way. It's a scratch your own edge community, and if you want to take a big chunk of your life and devote it to Drupal 8, you should be allowed to do so. Nobody should stop you. So I don't think it should be the DA coordinating and organizing. I think um, maybe in terms of funding, that might get trickier because the DA or some other entity would need to handle the funding for that. So maybe it's like the community decides, and then that person gets uh, funding support in order to do it. Uh, so the DA is actually prohibited from trying to shape the direction of core development. That's like part of their charter. Um, so I think that's something important. Unless you know we wanted to change that, it, it and some people suggest there should be like a different organization that's responsible for that. Um, but something else that I think I, I might disagree a little bit is that um, there's there's something to be said for being willing to work on something. But you get people who are a lot more committed when you when you ask them when you ask them say I've noticed that you're interested in this and you try to, you empower them to be a, a leader, to be an authority in a particular area. So I think that just saying that it will happen organically, I mean, I think that you get people interested in organically, but I think that um, then like nominating them to be someone and do something and giving them responsibility and control over it uh, makes them feel a lot more successful and then they'll give you more time without feeling burnt out about it, so. Totally, agree with you. <laughs> Me first. Uh, no. So uh, what Jess is saying is really relevant to Ash's talk that was on diversity and how uh, underrepresented groups don't volunteer themselves for things. They just don't. Uh, so if we want some diversity in leadership, uh, we might have to recruit and ask because they won't volunteer themselves. They don't have any um, like 
you know, there's no pictures of people that are like them in whatever way like is like, so. I think that's true for the, for some of the under level, but I think for like the lead top tier people, they need to come of their own free will. I don't think we could ask someone like, hey Larry, do you want to be an initiative owner? That's like uh, a- No. <laughs> <laughs> that's what he did to you? Wow, okay. Yeah, All so of you, I so am wrong. <laughs> most of the Drupal 8 initiative leads currently um, were invited to be so by Dries based on things we were already right. ranting about doing. Um, some, some of us louder than others. Um, some of us were more willing than others, but we're, we were all appointed by Dries based on trends he was seeing. That mm -hmm. part I don't think is a problem. Definitely getting the team like you're describing behind those people and making sure that those people have the, back, the backing and authority to be able to then coordinate that team and get things done, I think is uh, critically important. So it's, it's building out that structure and accepting that structure is the challenge. I think figuring out who's going to be part of it is an easier problem to solve mm. to an extent. Like they have the Until will, the, but not the means. Yeah, you know, like Greg was willing to, you know, throw himself into configuration management because he's just that crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'd say, you know, unless he'd had you know, support from his employer at the time to do so, probably would not have been able to do so. Not everyone has an employer who has the willingness or financial capability to put someone 50% on core for a long period. And or 100%. <laughs> or 100%. So you know, th those employers that can, hats off to them. Um, but not everyone does. and. You know, that's where I could, I think the, which parts of the team get funding uh, and how much, I think that's really the trickiest problem, oh, yeah. followed closely by accepting that there, the structure would be there and that would be direction setting for core. Even if it's that's still coming down from Dries, it's much more top down than we've done in the past. The first year of Drupal 8 was a lot of painful arguments and discussions about that, you know, this isn't bottom up grassroots, how dare you? And it took a very, very long time and not a small amount of blood to get past that. And so mm -hmm. we need to make sure we can keep doing that. Yeah, I didn't add that into the presentation, but it's such a good point that like, even when you're initiative owner, and we've seen this under Blade, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean everyone just lines up behind you and decides to do what you're doing. Um, and you guys need some support that is top down and you need the authority in order to make those decisions um, and get consensus, obviously. Yeah. Let's not overlook that. But, but it's often um, easier to build consensus when you're building consensus from a position of authority right. than from a position of first among equals. <laughs> um, it just, the process becomes smoother even if the end result is the same. Mm. Thanks. That's Larry, if you don't know Larry. You can know him by his vest. <laughs> yeah. So I'm Gabor, uh, and I want to talk about the money question. Mm -hmm. um, so there's like three or four reasons that I did not go into the money thing for the EMI. So the first is there was a lot of, as, as I've heard and as I've expected, there was a lot of overhead to get money. So if you ask Greg, he took a lot of time to, to pitch his stuff yeah. and to Proposals get and, you know, Proposals convincing and, arguments yeah. and expectations and, yeah. Figuring out how you propose at all. And then <laughs> the next thing is the, the entity that handles the money. So if I would take money, then I would need to pay taxes on top and I would lose like a third of the money, at least on ta paying taxes for my government. So I would not take, so that would not be a good idea. <laughs> so we would need to have an entity that's not the DA because the DA is prohibited from right. directing core development. So they might not be able to handle this money and we don't really have an entity that can handle this money. So we have to create one, so we which is why it's so out, hard. So we figure out some kind of entity that will, not, that will be able to handle that money and, and just funnel it through. And the third one is, was the, like what Larry said, is who gets the money and how they get the money and how that's decided uh, is like, if you're doing a sprint, then you're flying in people and like you, maybe some, some people, the company will pay for them, others, they don't have a company, they need to pay for themselves. If they are freelancers, they, they earn money, but they don't have money to fly. And if they are students, they don't earn money. 
And there's all those hard questions that mm -hmm. are, of course, there are one of answers to them. So there's no clear rule that we can set, I think. Yeah. And but it, there's a lot of possibility for muddy things there. Right. And happen. I think just to piggyback on the last thing that you were saying about like companies sponsoring people, like Commerce Guys sponsored me to be here and about 15 of my colleagues, which is awesome. And yay. Um, but not everyone is so lucky. But at the same time, like if um, like Chris, who is an initiative lead owner and works for Commerce Guys, if he weren't, if he were able to get a scholarship, would Commerce Guys fund him? Is the tricky question there when you're getting into like money, because obviously like saving ten grand a year or whatever in flights and, and whatnot is kind of nice for a company. So I think it gets really like it's so hard when you start talking about funds. Because then you have the chicken before the egg issue of they have funding today, but will they have funding tomorrow if they find out that they can get a scholarship? It's also hairy. So, I mean, honestly, if, if I were to decide today, it would be something like um, look at who's in a company that is getting karma for doing a lot of work and then balance that like 50-50 with people who are making a really big contribution who can't go themselves. And I think we have to favor people who would onboard and become experts over um, things like, you know, random person who does stuff once or twice. If someone is habitually committed to an initiative, I think that's a great sign of someone who should be funded because then maybe they can become, you know, a lieutenant to the initiative owner or something. And I obviously think initiative owners should be funded because you guys are so critical to the entire process. I mean, would any of you even accept that if you could get a year of funding to work on Drupal 8? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I have a better job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a separate question. No, it's not. For a year. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the, yeah. Hard, that's the hard question. So I think the hard question is what you do a year later. Right. Yeah. So I mean, if we're gonna. They could buy your time from Palantir, but then it's gonna cost three times as much as if you were an independent. Exactly. Right. Just to repeat that yeah. for everyone in the back, um, funding and like giving up your job to do this for a short time is different for a freelancer than someone who has a full time job. It's just not the same commitment. So I mean, that's just where it gets really tough. And I think in order to have the success that we need, like we need you guys to be available. It's really hard when you have a second job besides Drupal Initiative owner, and you can't always be around to support and you know help because you need to earn the dollar dollar, right? So I mean, it's tricky. And there's at least two more points that I wanted to yeah. mention about money. <laughs> as the other the other one which dovetails in what you said is that if if commerce guy if if Chris or me would come on a scholarship, would we get a scholarship since we're already working for Acquia and Commerce Guys? And Acquia and Commerce Guys are here to have their big presence at the booth and market their company. So mm -hmm. why would we get paid for a come because we're also Acquians <laughs> and Commerce Guys people? And you know, yeah. this is a wishy-washy question. There. Yeah, like and I would get sent either way, so I don't need a, a scholarship, but maybe yeah. like if, if my boss heard that I could get a scholarship, maybe he wouldn't offer to send me, you know? And then I'd be like, oh shit, I need to get a scholarship or something. Yeah. I mean, you, we don't know how it's gonna turn out. And then the other thing is like, uh, the, the who gets the money is we have volunteers who work a lot coming up that, coming up from the from the beginner part from uh, from down. And what, what's the point when when they are at a point where, where we finance them and how do we tell? So we have, in DMI, we have quite a few people who just grew out of out of being totally new contributors, and they are like in the, they, they we have people who are like two percent, they 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 are mentioning two percent of the core comments in Drupal eight, which is huge, and yeah. and they just were an unknown two months ago or three months ago, so it's that's a hard question there. Yeah, maybe it becomes like rolling funding, short term funding. Hmm, tough. So hi, Christoph. Um, Initiatives were really interesting for Drupal 8 because... Can you get a little bit closer to the mic? Okay. Thanks. So, initiatives were really interesting for me in, during Drupal 8 development because it got me really deeply involved into Drupal core. Um, but I'm now talking from, from a field API um, perspective as a co-maintainer. Our plan, 
we had a really nice slide this morning during our session. The plan for Drupal 8 for Field API was just sit back and relax and basically <laughs> just, I mean, that was it. I mean, Field, Field API is in core and you can do a lot of stuff. And then suddenly Drupal 8 decides to rewrite everything and then we have to do, and we have to follow that. And we are not really an initiative, but there's a lot of work. And I mean, a lot of stuff touches what Greg has been doing, but there's also the plugin, plugin system. So do you see some place for subsystems in core that are not an initiative? Yeah. And we, we actually really need a lot of help on that part as well. I mean, just basically only me and Wychat and, and maybe two other peoples. Um, right. But we don't have that visibility. I mean, Field API needs to be converted, but it's not open and public, I mean. So you bring up a really good point. At what point does something deserve initiative status, essentially, right? Yeah. I think my personal choice would be when the workload exceeds four to five people working their asses off. Then it kind of seems to me like it deserves attention because that means lots of people are gonna need to review it and comment on it and make sure that it works with everything else. Yeah, right now, but like if we could get a decent team together, like if that's, a, I think, the point of having a team. Yeah. If you're an initiative, it's because you need a team of people. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think if you're getting to that point where you're doing the work of three or four people and it's burning you out, mm -hmm. you could use a team, you should probably we be should an initiative. And if that means that we have like 20 initiatives for Drupal 9, mm -hmm. so be it. Fund everyone, get your shit done, and be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so I've sat in a bunch of core conversations now and the topics keep coming up, the subject keeps coming up about uh, we need the resources and if we can actually do the funding and oh yeah we want to get a lot of new people involved in core as core contributors and um, so uh, one of the points that I think that I think needs to be considered, like you're talking about for Drupal 9, like, oh, I've got this great idea, we're gonna have the initiative owners, and we're gonna have uh, this many experts, and we're gonna fund this many people for each of the initiatives, and we've already started touching on some of this stuff here with the idea, like, I'm a freelancer, and um, so there's also been talk in other sessions about like, oh yeah, so just demand, I think it was Greg who actually said, demand that your employers pay for your, you know, you are a resource that's in demand, so demand that your employers will pay for some of your time to work on core. Well, there's people like me that are the freelancers that like, you know, we don't really have that situation that we can just demand that somebody's gonna hire us and pay us money to work on doing core stuff. And again, we're freelancers, so if I'm volunteering my time doing stuff, and I, mean, I understand, when anybody volunteers, they're not getting paid, but like, I don't have a salary, and the time that I volunteer to do things, I'm not gonna be making the money. So, That's yeah. That's for everyone. Uh, no, it's true <laughs> for everyone, no, I understand. But so like when you hear the talk about, yeah, we want to get more people involved in core and we want to be able to fund things. And so that, you know, that's a thing that like for a person for me, it's like, yeah, that would be awesome to be able to get some funding so that I could actually work on Drupal and do stuff with this. But then it does bring up the questions because like who do you, you know, you need some of these experts on the project. But when you're looking at these experts like Larry and the question is already brought up. So even the idea of funding Larry. OK, so if you're going to fund Larry because he puts in a ton of work and he really knows what he's doing, that's great. And he's being rewarded for it. But then you're not meeting the goal of getting new people involved that could then maybe pick up some of the workload later on. And then there's also the other issue of like even the idea of funding Larry, like when Greg brought up like, yeah, but are you willing to quit your job for a year if we fund you for a year? So this, the, the idea of like, oh, let's get funding and let's add more resources has another component to it is the, then the, those practical aspects of like, when you're talking about who gets the money, you were asking like what initiatives get the money, but there's a big, there's another question as well, it's like, but who are the people that you're gonna be paying to do it? Because there's the pros and cons of like, you guys don't know who I am, and sure, I'd love mm -hmm. to step up and say, yeah, pay me to work on Drupal. But you guys are gonna wanna look to somebody who's like, but we don't know him, and we don't know if he's gonna be any good at this, we don't wanna give him the money, so we wanna look to the people who have already proven themselves no, but I then you're tying yourself to the situation of like right. they're invested and you aren't bringing new people into the process. So there's, a, there's another layer of this that I think that you need to think about is like the disper you know, this how, how the dispersal of the money would work. Because there's, yeah. so there's tons of people in the community like me that say, yeah, that would be totally awesome for me to be able to get paid to work on Drupal. But so there's so currently an expected investment from your part before we get to know you and we, and we get you on board. But that's the truth of any job, you know, personal growth. 
<laughs> That's true of any job. <laughs> personal, personal growth and job development is always our own personal responsibility on our own time. And so, you know, if that means contributing the patches so that you get visibility or taking a class to learn a new technology or building a personal project to get more visibility, those all fall into the same things. Yeah, really. like that's why I think it should be tiered. Because if you're, like your situation, you're a freelancer, you're interested in working on this, you're willing to commit to it if someone can fund you because you just can't afford to stop all your freelancing work and do it full time. I completely understand that, neither can I. Um, so I think the best way to go about that is to have you start at the beginner tier. Um, so you start reviewing patches and you work with Jess and all the awesome people doing core mentoring and they will help you start out. And then when you feel comfortable, you move on to the next level and you help document where you came from and how you got to where you are so that, that that learning path can start to begin for everyone else. That is a critical component to the entire project. If we don't have people doing that, teaching other people how to learn what you did, then we're kind of screwed. So it's a, it's a huge task. It has to be crowdsourced. It has to be a group effort. And if you want to get to the point where you feel like you're an expert, I think you need to start at those levels unless you're just like, a crazy genius <laughs> and you can just go straight to the top um, in which case you've probably already like committed major patches and got the visibility that you wanted so deciding who gets funding is a tough is it's a bear but at the same time I think that like experts are critical to the project success initiative owners are critical to the project success if we want to reduce all the pain points those two pieces are needed more than anything else so I would start there and I think the initiative owners are going to be really key into helping decide who they want in that core group of people working with them every day or every week or however much you know funding they have to get those people regularly on their team and i think that they know who they who they need to work with like larry said like finding the people is not hard um, getting them to do the stuff is hard because either they need training or they need time right right so i and i agree with all that i'm not i totally understand what you're you're saying so but then what what that brings you back to is because the, the reason I bring this up is that a lot of the talks has been here like, oh, all our problems are going to be solved if only we would have funding for That's the people. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> well, well, Nobody's okay. saying that. But th there's, um, what you get back to, and I agree with your idea that you need to put in your time, you need to prove yourself, you need to do personal growth, but then that puts a person like Larry in the position that I'm like, okay, yeah, I want to make my way up the ladder here, but I'm not going to give 10 hours a week or 20 hours a week to pull that. I'm going to, you know, maybe I want to do something for an hour a week and then put somebody like Larry in a position because he made the comment. He's like, if I've got 50 people for one hour a piece, I, I really can't get anything done with that. I'd rather have the 10 people for five hours a piece. Larry has access to experts who have access to funding. Right, right, but <laughs> That's what okay. she anyway. Saying. Anyway, yes, thank you for your comment. I have like two pages of notes here. I don't, <laughs> even, I don't even know where to start. Everyone else sit down. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I, I actually sympathize a lot with the last speaker. I, of course, did quit my job to um, get funded for Drupal Core and managed to do it successfully as a freelancer. Yay! And I did, but but I mean, I had all of the downsides that, that were brought up. I did give up 35% of that income straight to the federal government. Um, I did um, suddenly at the end of that find myself with no money and, and wondering what I was going to do now with my life because unlike normal, I mean, you know, normally you're freelancing and you, you're reaching the end of a gig and you're shopping for next gigs and I was at the end of this gig but I'm not really a freelancer I'm just a guy who got a bunch of money to work on core and now all of that money is about to be gone and I'm like well do I want to fundraise some more do I want to get a real job do I want to be a freelancer to which the answer of all was no but um, <laughs> but that's a personal decision you know and I mean a lot of a lot of a lot of stuff comes down to priorities in your life and things like that but um, um, you know I, I, I sympathize a lot and obviously not not all of the 1012 200 people who contribute patches to Drupal Core are going to get funded. I think that's a realistic thing to say. Uh, I guess I'll, I'll leave my comments to the most controversial ones. Um, <laughs> We're just starting. Um, I, in, in your slides, and Larry was saying this too, you sort of had an initiative lead and then a team, and I think that's the wrong model. 
um, I think I think the initiative lead should be a team, and I think that the way that the views um, team did that is really um, excellent and should really be used as our model, because I don't believe in and I don't think it works well with our community um, that that the single vision of one person should be should be going top down to all of oh. these people. You should have you should have I, I like the idea of having a variety of viewpoints and a variety of skill sets together coming to these conclusions as a small group and then branching those off to the greater community. And it actually helps a lot because um, you know, I, when, I, when I launched my 350 comment thread about file formats for CMI, I was the only one sitting there trying to manage that. And you know, within eight hours, I wanted to shoot myself. I had nobody else to <laughs> fall back on. But if you've got a team of people, you can all come out, you can all respond to different questions depending on your expertise, and everybody can sort of take the brunt of it. And when somebody gets burnt out, they fall apart, and somebody else can come in, and you're on vacation, you don't have to be thinking about it, and stuff like this. Um, and I think I think having a, te a small team of equals leading each project is a really really important thing. Right. So this I/O block, you want like three or four of those. Yeah, basically. And then a, like five or six experts in that case, because different people working with different groups. Well, to some extent that melds because in the case of the views team, they were the experts as well, mm -hmm. um, and they did a lot of the work. But they also had a lot of a lot of people underneath them contributing up as well. Yeah, especially but that's, when you that's not sustainable if you want to do the other stuff like the communication, coordination, long-term planning, all of that is hard to do all at once. I mean, you know that. It is all it's hard tough. to do it all at once, but you have you have people with specific you skill sets in there. You have the authority to organize those things. That's right. I'm not the lead architect for views. I could never be the lead architect for views. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. So what I just interrupted Greg to say was that you do not have, and to tell Shannon, you don't have to be the lead architect to also be the person who oversees, like, the strategic integration with larger entities and that's mm -hmm. all because I did the second part and definitely not the first ever because I mean if you have a cross-functional team of four people and one person's really good at being the communication and project management part and one person's really good at being the technical architect and one person's really good at the front end side and then one person's kind of a generalist who helps work on and review patches I think that's a really really strong team that you've got there especially if some of those skills translate among the other members so that they can fall back on each other when they need to um, I mean this prospect this concept of cross-functional teams has been very popular in software development mm -hmm. in, uh, in for the last few years and I think it's super and I think it totally applies to us of course that comes to the problem where we have no project managers and designers and <laughs> things like that but that's a recruiting problem that's something right. else but do you have the recruiting problem on your level right now um, for like could you tomorrow come up with a team of three or four people to support you I could if I had a way to fund them <laughs> You know, okay. I mean, I mean, you know, the so only you know who you would want like on that team. So this is yeah, definitely sure. a possibility. I mean, you know, then I mean, I've already got I've already got four major contributors to CMI. There's like me, Alex, Sun, and Bejebus, right mm -hmm. now. Now that's not as cross-functional as I might necessarily like, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's more maybe more dysfunctional than cross-functional, but uh, cross dysfunctional. Yeah, yeah, but. Uh, um, but but the concepts the concepts are are still there and you know I I really wish that we had that I had started with a team of four people it wouldn't have been those four people because I didn't really know any of them at the time but um, and started funding the whole team from the very beginning instead of just coming up with that for myself at the end um, another really controversial thing I want to bring up is the fact <laughs> that um, ten seconds <laughs> <laughs> as as a community we are extremely um, suspicious of centralization and mm -hmm. that's a huge right. problem <laughs> okay it's yeah. a huge problem um, because it's really 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 difficult to do the kind of fundraising that we're talking about without some sort of centralization and without some sort of organization behind it and um, the kind of um, businesses that typically drive our community namely service businesses to be honest um, don't have the kind of um, funding or all the time to be able to f to fund at the level that we need and they don't have the long-term vision either um, their service their their businesses are very cyclical um, they tend to have to put a lot of money away 
way to get through the downsides of the cycles. Um, and it's very, it's very hard for them to, to devote significant resources beyond, say, you know, 10% of someone's time to, um, to this kind of contribution, right. unless they want to take away four people's 10% and give it to one person, which doesn't necessarily work out in all situations. Um, you know, I, I've talked a lot about how I've talked to members of other open source projects for a long time about their funding models, and almost all of them have a commercial entity behind them. And while there's a downside to that, you know, I mean, the Fedora project um, has it written into their, their uh, clause that their board of directors has to have at least two members from Red Hat, and it's a representation of Red Hat's dedication and of resources to the project. But on the other hand, um, it means that there are dedicated resources to the project. Yeah. And, um, you know, Vision, um, 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 coherent focused vision is not necessarily something the Drupal community has been very strong at over the years. Um, and, and while um, I understand the suspicions around centralization and around um, focusing um, power and you know, sort of ideals around, around a, a specific group, um, I think it's going to be very, very, very difficult to achieve our goals if we don't figure out some way to do that. And I mean, it, just the monetary side is like, you know, I think that we could probably convince the DA to sort of be the fiduciary representative of an initiative, like they, because they do that with Drupal camps right now, actually. They, they hold the bank account for the Drupal camp and, and act yeah. as the money people. Like they do the granting. Yeah, basically. right. And so the, the camp people collect money and they just provide a bank account and a legal entity to hold it. Um, but, I mean, it, w without some sort of organization collecting money, I mean, you know, the, the scale of money that we're talking about, I think things are going to be really difficult. And I think that's something that we as a community, given the size that we've grown to, are going to have to really, really think about over the years. Okay, uh, let me recap what you're saying. And I won't saying. say the A word. <laughs> let me recap what you just said. So, not one person as a figurehead at the very top of the tier, but a team of you know two, three, maybe even four people working as a hive mind. Um, and then having a, a group, an entity that's responsible for the money management so that you guys don't get taxed to death and get screwed basically. And then having a, a way to um, make it acceptable to the community that some people are getting funded for certain things and some people aren't. And that, and that, you know, all of that, and that a lot of that funding is being centralized in one place. Right. And that, that, that may also mean that that one place has a greater voice is than others evil. do. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I ha I'll leave the rest of my notes for later. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. I'll see you in a couple hours. Sure. For a beer. Yes, let's. <laughs> so we already do have some funding models that live in parallel to what's getting proposed here. We've got the large scale Drupal project that uh, Acquia has running that if I... Sure, uh, so, so my understanding of the large scale Drupal project is that large organizations like NBC have contracts with Acquia that involve hosting and other services and it involves a sum of money that is pooled for common interests. I don't know exactly what that funds, but I imagine it's things like large scale performance because large sites like NBC have similar needs. Uh, I don't think there's anything stopping, say, a consortium of colleges from starting a nonprofit that could fund fixes that colleges need. And that may not line up to, you know, a nonprofit funding just whiskey, but if we had a nonprofit that was interested in making Drupal better for all universities. Multiple universities could give money directly to that nonprofit. That nonprofit could then fund whatever they want. They could give 10% of their money to Whiskey, 10% to Mobile. Uh, we, don't need, we don't necessarily need one funding model to rule them all. There's, yeah. there's nothing stopping anyone right now from creating a nonprofit dedicated to making Drupal run better on shared hosting. Yeah, We've I was just about to add to I, what I'm, you're saying because, mm -hmm. like, why is everyone talking about funding as in giant entity X yeah. funds 20% of someone's salary? What about crowdfunding? We are huge. We are millions of people. Why can't we crowdsource this bit? You know? Sure. We we could even so we could even. Didn't you raise a bunch yeah. of money in Kickstarter? No. No. Oh, okay. 
percent of that money came from three uh, organizations. Oh, okay, so maybe that model doesn't work, but maybe it also doesn't have the same visibility. Like, DA has a lot of visibility at at the DrupalCon. Maybe if there was a be a core benefactor, you know, badge that you can put on your site or it goes on your tag or something, and you donated five bucks to help work on core. <laughs> if a million people do that, what? Right, you'd have to. Like, that's so, implied. So what I'm saying is we don't necessarily need one entity to rule them all. We already have de facto entities like Commerce Guys that funds the open source project Drupal Commerce. That is a funding model for supporting open source. Uh, yeah, but they're an entity. <laughs> they, right. They have taxable issues and things like that. Sure. So what I'm saying is... To my knowledge, there is no legal barrier stopping anyone in this room from creating a nonprofit dedicated towards solving issue X in Drupal. And I think the, the large mental hurdle that we have is if we start a funding agency, the Drupal community will push back against whatever centralization there is. That, that nonprofit could be dedicated to solving the least controversial issues in Drupal. It could be dedicated to fixing the oldest code in Drupal. <laughs> if, if the mental hurdle we have right now is that funding by its very nature is controversial, someone c in this room could start a nonprofit dedicated solely to fixing Drupal WTFs only. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, they could, but how many people actually take that step? I feel like if there was an entity dedicated to handling just the fundraising and then the like delegation and the allotment of that funding is a crowdsourced um, decision or a consensus-based decision, that would take a lot of the so-and-so got money, and I didn't kind of crap out of it, because it would be a group decision. I think that that would make a, it a lot easier to manage, versus, like, you want to do something? Go start a nonprofit. How do I do that? I think, I think you have to be really motivated. I think it's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to shoot down your idea. It's awesome. Go do it. <laughs> right. Well, what I'm saying is I don't personally have the motivation, but if all of us just keep saying we need an entity, we need an entity, we need an entity, we're not going to get one until someone just makes one. Yeah, I think we have to have infrastructure to make that happen. I just want, I just want to give you data because you've asked about LSD and you have ideas about what might, a uh, logical Drupal might finance. Uh, I, I think Acquia is not does not want to brag a lot about it because we are not doing it so that people see we are all doing all that stuff. Uh, part of it is because the central control problem that, oh, Acquia is funding all this stuff, so everything's controlled by Acquia. But there's been, uh, there's been funding for things like the, from the new node edit form all through to the views initiative to configuration management to, to the parts of Whiskey. Uh, so different people in different areas were, have been uh, funded and helped by funds from LSD. Their individual blog posts about the, their work mention this funding, but there's no like central list of all this stuff that's being funded. So it's not secret information, but it's not something that, that Acquia wants to brag about because there, I don't think it's a point, there's a point in bragging about it. Hi. <laughs> okay, so I'm somebody who has quit their job to work on Drupal 8. Yay! <laughs> um, What's your name? Alex Pot. Oh, hi, Alex. Yeah. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> I just met him, but I've been like saying his name for a year. <laughs> so um, it's we're not really confronting one of the facts that core development has become professional. Can you get closer to the mic? So core, prof core development is Thanks. professional. We are behaving professionally. You actually and have to face the mic for it to pick up what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, it's easier to talk to you facing you. So core development is a professional activity now. And there are big companies involved in funding people to work on it. And the reason that we don't let the DA fund it is because we think it's got some direction on it. But companies have direction on core. So there is a conflict of interest already. So get over ourselves. We have to create some entity to do it. <laughs> I want to ask a question. Why do you think companies have input into core? Because Commerce Guys has like zero input into core. Chris decides what he wants to do. Oh. Okay, so you're saying um, Commerce Guys would fund something that we think will benefit us um, in that way. Yeah, so sure. Right. 
Right, but actually, I don't know that that's really benefiting commerce guys directly. I think they just, <laughs> they're just like, we should fund core. <laughs> and that's it. Eventually. <laughs> that, that's why I started working on CMIs, because I was deploying massive sites, and I was struggling with features, and I was working for Capgemini, a really, really big company, and I wanted to go solve that problem. So it was easier for Capgemini in the future to do it. So they funded me. Um, there was one more thing that's kind of completely slipped my mind. <laughs> what was it? Ah, it's gone. Sorry. Oh, well, come back. <laughs> Actually, that's a good question. I don't know. Five minutes. Five minutes of questions or five minutes before the break? Five minutes before the break. Okay. Right? Ah, uh, no, I... Shit, what I was going to say. The line's so long. I've gone. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I did yes. oh, okay. And it's back. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> uh, it was about uh, the... Both for the gentleman who said that um, he was interested in being he was interested in contributing and being involved, but um, in a in a freelance schedule didn't feel like he had the time to devote to it. Um, and also about the funding question in general. So I think that something that we can that we can do more of a middle ground is like micro grants, and um, this can take the form of like you know two hundred dollars or five hundred dollars that you give someone to work on one issue. Um, this is this is something that um, well. Never mind, I probably can't say that. But um, there's also there's also the idea of giving someone a specific, you know, a specific donation or contribution. Contribution is the word we're supposed to use um, to do something particular, like uh, checks, like paid for my air, airplane ticket to Barcelona so that I could go to Barcelona to help solve problems for views and CMI. Um, he he just gave that contribution. He gave it directly to me because there was a trust there. Um, but that kind of small funding, you know. $300, $500, $1,000 is also useful, especially for people who aren't ready to, you know, quit their full-time job and work on core. Or and sign I think a check for 10K. If, right. And if there's, um, if, you know, if the, you already have some minimum level of, like, I, I mean, the way, the way we vet people in an open source community is through their contributions. So you already have to have some minimum level of, of work to demonstrate that, that you're going to, you know, make good use of funding that you get. But I think that for people who are, People that we already have trust in and that we know will do will do good work, um, you know that that's like our interview process, right? And I think that it's so that that kind of thing I think is possible. And I also just wanted to mention a bit um, how Views and Core was funded because I think there's a lot of mis misconceptions about it. Um, and it, it, this is kind of a, in a response to your point, Shannon. So um, our community chip and raised thirteen thousand dollars, which is amazing. But <laughs> the most well-known module in the world only raised $13,000. Like, um, so half of the $13,000 went to fund my time, and I was living like, like, you know, practically poverty level. Like, I, I, I worked out a situation with my employer where um, I would, you know, work five hours a week from them, which was very generous of them because they knew they were kind of screwing me over and that I was gonna leave soon, so that was sort of a, a their way of patting me on the back. Um, that was probably not the best way to say that, but, um, <laughs> But I, I worked out that situation, and then I, I was paid with chip-in money for the summer. Um, and it, it wasn't a lot of money, and it, you know, it was just enough to like, make my rent and feed myself. Um, but I was willing to do it because I was really excited about what I was working on. It was, it was still a dream job. Um, and I think that a lot of people are in that situation where they deliberately deprive themselves of things that they would get through employment because they, they really enjoy the, the work that they're doing and they care about it. Um, but I, I don't, I don't, it, well, you know, What's I mean, bullshit? maybe it isn't, <laughs> but on the other hand, oh, yeah. on the okay, other so hand, wait, let so me say this so that people in the back in here, it's bullshit that people have to deprive themselves in order to work on core. Amen. I made a decision. I made a personal decision, you know, and I, I don't regret it at all because what happened is, um, at the end of that summer, uh, there was a situation where I wasn't going to have access to the funding anymore. Um, and I w for, went through a brief period of panic where I, you know, I'm, oh my god, I'm going to get evicted, I don't know what's going to go on here. Um, but at that point, when, when it became clear that uh, VDC was about to lose a quarter of its contributors before Views was merged in, Acquia stepped up and, uh, and funded me. Um, the, and I, it, wasn't, it certainly wasn't full time, um, but I got you know, like $8,000 from Acquia, significantly more than I got from the chip-in. Um, and that was for the next segment. And then for, for the third segment of the release cycle, uh, Tengen actually funded me. And so it, it, even though the community chip and raised a lot of money, which is amazing, 
the, mo the amount of money it raised compared to these, these large companies with an interest in open source who, who are, have their entire business model built around an open source um, project, you know, contributed a lot more of the funding. And that's, that's just me, like um, three companies, so Airdfish, ZivTech, and, um, oh, New yeah, New Digital Partnership, thank you. See, they all work for different places now, Daniel doesn't, but um, so three companies uh, actually funded like like a third to a half of those three guys dying, and they've got their heads down and they're not even paying attention, but. Um, <laughs> and that's actually- You in the that, back. <laughs> I mean, the value, the value of funding them was a lot, a lot greater than the value of funding me in terms of just the number of developer hours that they, you know, their companies didn't bill them for, so. Hmm. So basically, like, community chip-in's great idea, but not necessarily um, for large-scale fundraising and mostly big companies. Oh, well, companies, tend to chip in more than your average person in terms of the total sum, is the summary of what you're saying then. More, more than the aggregate. More than the aggregate of people. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Um, oh, wait, how are we doing on time? Do we want to run through the break? Yeah. Yeah. I no, please, because my session's next. Okay, do you want to set up? No, have a, okay, okay, I'll, I'll set up, and then you can, yeah, that's Yeah, you can take over while we chat. So a lot more things, like I, I was thinking in the line that I could say, but, but a lot of this is let's try and think about ways to be creative about how to, how to go off and incentivize people to go off and to, to work in core. There's a lot of different ways we can do it. It's not just about finding penny, money to go off and pay people full time. If the micro grants is a really good idea. Um, if there's a way to go off and simply provide advertising uh, or some sort of company rep recognition on Drupal.org, so you can identify who are the companies who've gone off and, and contributed. The, the work that I've done on accessibility in Drupal, I've gotten absolutely no contracts from that. The, the, you know, I've put in hundreds if not thousands of hours, and a lot of companies have benefited from that work. It hasn't been open concept that has benefited from that work. It would be good if there was some way to go off and to, to I mean, there, there are people who are talking about ways that, that uh, the accessibility is really a marker for, for people to, uh, one of the differentiates Drupal from other CMSs in the sales, in the sales CXO meeting on Monday. Um, I'd really like to see some of those people go off and say, well, here's an expert and let's draw in those experts and try and find ways to, um, not just on accessibility, but on views and uh, there's people who here have made serious time and energy to that, but there's no way on Drupal.org to, to acknowledge that and there's not a culture that is where we're seeking out each other's experts or finding those people who have really contributed a lot to bring them in to go off and solve a problem. Right. Um, Just to, I got to cut you off because we're running out of time and I have to go really soon because apparently the BOF people are like, where's Shannon? Um, so just to come back to your point and Jess's point about microfunding, I was just having a conversation with people yesterday about these two things and the idea that we had was to do um, like benefit dinners for microfunding and karma distribution at the same time and then for like the people there's some debate about creating leaderboards and like people who contribute more than others, like giving them more recognition. I mean, of course, we want to like pat people on the back and make them, like, recognize them for their contribution. Um, and Money or what do you mean contribution? for their code contribution. Yeah. There's also an element where I think we can do more to, to reach out to the culture outside of the Drupal shops and say, how do we get people who are using Drupal to go off and find ways to contribute to the, the effort? There's a lot more that, that uh, like in, in the effort to go off and fundraise to bring Vincenzo here, all of that money came from the Drupal community, almost ex exclusively that money came from within our ranks. It didn't come from the people like the governments and the universities and other agencies who are benefiting from the work that's being done on accessibility. It's being done be from us and, and within our ranks. And we have to look outside of our ranks and think big. So like, how do we bring other people in to go off and to fund, the, to make this happen? Because we can't just keep, mm -hmm. you know, get, asking each other to give more money. So going outside of the Drupal community to raise funds. Yes. Star. <laughs> So I'll, I'll real, real quick, guys. I think yeah. we can probably only take like two more questions, then I have to go. So sorry. Uh, this is my first DrupalCon. I represent one of these large organizations. We do three billion dollars a year in revenue. Congratulations! We over six hundred million dollars. <laughs> we are betting our business on Drupal. As a large corporation, I can tell you that unless the community comes up with a way where we can, and companies like mine can contribute in a way money is easy for us to give we don't have we don't have necessarily specific agendas we're a member of large-scale Drupal we're, we're some of the other stuff 
I think you need to, as a community, figure out how you're going to deal with some of this stuff, where you're going to put the money, throw out all the issues about control. You need someone simply to do the project management, the, the helping to organize, the, all of the administrative stuff. Even if that organization did nothing other than just hired people whose job it was just to help answer emails. Um, that administrative background, in, and I think this, the other thing you need to do is you need to, this has already been solved. Mozilla, Linux Foundation, MySQL, I mean, there's a, there's a plethora of communities out there who have solved this problem. Why are you trying to solve it again? Mm. This is the first step to that, but I hear what you're saying. So we should find the people who will get the infrastructure together and fund them first so that they can continue on, basically. Yep. So obviously I enjoyed your presentation, but one of the funny things is that committers weren't on your thing and they're a really oh, scarce yeah, they are. resource right now. They were the big C. <laughs> they were, they were. Mm -hmm. um, And crowdsourcing where the funding um, goes in the community is a really good idea, rather than crowdsourcing the funding. Thank you, sir. Wait, crowdsourcing the what instead of crowdsourcing the funding? Where the, where the funding goes rather than crowdsourcing oh, yeah. the funding. So using the crowd to decide who gets it instead of asking them for money. Cool. Thanks, everyone.